So the epistle appointed to be read for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And if a man be overtaken, brethren, in any fault, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one, another, one another's burdens, and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be some thing, whereas he is no thing, he deceiveth himself. But let everyone prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For everyone shall bear his own burden. And let him that is instructed in the word communicate to him that instructeth him in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh, of the flesh also shall reap corruption. But he that soweth in the spirit, of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And in doing good, let us not fail. For in due time we shall reap, not failing. Therefore, whilst we have time, let us work good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Please stand for the Holy Gospel, which is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus went into a city that is called Naim, and there went with him his disciples and a great multitude. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, the dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a great multitude of the city was with her, whom, when the Lord had seen, being moved with mercy towards her, he said to her, Weep not. And he came near and touched the bier, and they that carried it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he gave him to his mother. And there came a fear upon them all, and they all glorified God, saying, A great prophet is risen up among us, and God hath visited his people. Thus are the words of today's holy gospel. Please be seated. Please raise your hand if you cannot hear me. So welcome, welcome once again, my dear friends, to St. John Bosco's mission here in the open air, which is lovely. It's finally starting to get cool, which is also lovely. Father Perfect is grateful for your prayers. He continues to recover. Please continue your prayers. What has been done for him is really only a palliative. It's not a, not a cure, so hopefully it will last for a while. Um, our September Novena to Our Lady Help of Christians for a permanent ch church and for a suitable temporary location continue. And this Novena finishes uh, Monday, tomorrow, uh, on the 19th of September. And the uh, instructions for what the Novena is is in the bullet, so please take it home with you. We need volunteers to manage the Mission Bookstore on the first Sunday of every month. And this involves setting it up and transporting and storing the books. So please be generous in your offering of your, of your services. And we could use male volunteers to set up and break down the, uh, the altar and the, and the chairs here for mass uh, every week. So please uh, speak to Johnny. Johnny Garon, uh, who's the coordinator, if you can uh, help out. And there's announcing the Angelus Press Conference. I'm sorry, it's not a press conference, it's an Angelus, Pre Angelus Press Conference, uh, which is going to be October 21st through the 23rd in Oberlin Park, Kansas. The theme is Restoring All Things in Christ, Our Hope for a Dying Age. So the, uh, the uh, uh, contact uh, information is in the bulletin. And uh, Carolyn Palm will be moving to PHX, what is it? Phoenix. Phoenix, I'm sorry, <laughs> should have guessed that, in early October. And uh, we will have a, uh, have a farewell dinner for her on September 29th, so please keep, uh, keep in touch so that the details can be uh, brought to you. 
Alrighty. And let us kneel down if we can and uh, say in our Father, how Mary and Holy be and all of our duty to part of friends, relatives, and benefactors. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. And let perpetual light shine upon them. Be their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed. Through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, my dear faithful, uh, as I think hope uh, most of you recall, um, I have now for the several past Sundays that I've been here, uh, been focusing on the sacraments, and uh, for the past, I think, two or three Sundays today, especially looking at the sacrament of confession because it's uh, an important sacrament. They're all important, but confession especially, I think. And I've been um, focusing on the uh, sacrament of confession because I must tell you candidly, as a confessor now of 16 years, uh, I'm gravely concerned for the spiritual welfare, not only of many of my penitents, but of those especially who only occasionally or worse, rarely approach the confessional. And so, my friends, the sacrament of confession is literally the only certain means any human being, not just Catholics, any human being has of being absolved of his offenses against God and thereby avoiding eternity in hell. So it's a sobering thought to consider all those poor people who are not Catholic, or those who are don't practice the faith, or don't take advantage of especially this sacrament, which is so essential. And yet, how too cavalierly do the few who do approach the confessional too frequently regard it and treat it. Um, as the church never tires, or never did tire, at least of saying, sin is a serious business. It has serious consequences. It occasions grave spiritual consequences, nothing less than spiritual death, and the danger of eternity in hell. The only antidote is confession. The only antidote. Yes, we can go on about perfect acts of contrition. How many do those? Especially outside of the church. How many do those? How many outside of the church, or we may even say these days in the new church, how many realize what a sin really is and how important it is to avoid sins? The ability which the priest has to restore to supernatural life anyone who is supernaturally dead in sin is well attested to by Jesus Christ himself, because you'll recall from the incident recounted in St. Mark's Gospel of the man healed of palsy. And our Lord said to him first, before healing him, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And interiorly, in the hearts and the minds of the scribes and Pharisees who listened to they said, Why does this man speak so? He blasphemeth. Who can forgive sins but only God? And they were right. They were right, because it's true. The only one who can forgive sins is God. Man could not forgive sins. And therefore, looking at Jesus as a mere man, which they did, they said he's blaspheming. He's taking upon himself something that only God can do. And in reply to their thoughts, Jesus said, which is easier to say, thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed, and walk. And he meant by that, which is easier to do? Is it easier to heal a man gravely ill merely by telling him to be well, be healed, or to forgive him his sins? 
To the Jews, neither was easy or even possible because one was a definite act, they both were a definite act of God. And what they didn't, what they didn't see or realize or refused to realize was that peace is not. St. Mark finishes this particular incident, incident in the gospel by our Lord saying, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man sick of palsy, I say to thee, arise, take up thy bed, go into thy house. And immediately he arose, and taking up his bed, he went his way in the sight of all. Everybody saw this. And the point of this incident in the life of our Lord is as unlikely as it is possible for any man to cure grave physical illness merely by saying, be cured, far more unlikely is it possible for any man to cure grave spiritual illness in the same way. And simple common sense tells us this. So, the response of those who witnessed the instant cure of the man sick of palsy, as, Saint, as, as the evangelist says, all wondered and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Indeed, I don't think anybody here has seen anything like this. Now, Jesus, who is God, did not keep this divine power to himself. On the first Easter Sunday, having just risen from the dead, he appears to his apostles, who are his first priests, his first bishops, and he says to them, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. And so there and then, my friends, was this power given to men, God's power the divine power to forgive sins, to annul the consequence of sins, which of course is eternal death and hell. And the apostles understood that this priest who had given them, this power which had just been given him by, by Jesus, was not just for them, but it was for every priest whom they would ordain and would be ordained down through the period of time to the present day. So every priest who is properly ordained, validly ordained, receives this power to forgive sins. It's an amazing thing. Would that the priest receive power to also instantly cure uh, various diseases? And that's another story why that's not. Reflecting on all of this, however, too few give this power and the men, the priests, who wield this power the respect they deserve. I'll give you, I'll grant you the, um, the, given the scant regard, the Novus Ordo Church, the No Church, thank you very much, has, with this precious means and this guarantee of the restoration of the divine life lost through mortal sin, it's no wonder at its present decline in uh, the Novus Ordo Church. Years ago, before I was a priest here in Los Angeles, and I approached a Jesuit priest and asked him to hear my confession. And he said, oh, you don't have to give a confession, you're fine. I said, I'm not bothering you to give a confession. He said, no, no, he said, have you, have you killed anybody? Have you robbed a bank? No, neither. Well, then you don't need to give a confession. So with that, he reduced the 10 commandments down to two, <laughs> the fifth and the seventh, and that's all we have to worry about. I insisted. Father, you will hear my confession. <laughs> he was not happy about that, and he told me so. But he did hear my confession. Um, however, that, at that point, I, I, I realized this is not this is something that's very wrong. And indeed, you, um, if you go to a pass by Novus Ordo churches these days, you see out in the signboard there, you know, reconciliation by appointment only. And then when you do go, you have to face the priest. He sees who you are, so there's no anonymity. And you have to go to the trouble of calling him on the phone and having him give you a hard time and you know, as to when and where and so forth and so on. So it's no wonder that those who, go, who are in the Novus Ordo, that they will come to us. And I know immediately that they haven't been to confession in years, in years, because they don't think it's necessary. And they're told that it's not necessary because God is so merciful, don't you know? Now, what is expected? What is demanded, if anything, of the beneficiaries of this inexpressible miracle, the, the 
the forgiveness of sin which casts us in hell. And to another man whom he had likewise healed after 38 years of paralysis, Jesus said, Sin no more, lest some worse thing happen to thee. So there he tells them, Sin no more, stop sinning. And then there's that the woman taken in adultery, of course, and the scribes and the Pharisees to uh, catch him up, hauled her before Jesus and threw her down in front of him and the crowd that was around and said, this woman has just been taken in. You can imagine how she felt because the punishment for that by the Jews was she had to be stoned. She had to be stoned, uh, taken in, a, in adultery. And so the scribes and the Pharisees um, expected Jesus to, well, they knew what he would do. He wouldn't stone her, and that, and thereby they would convict him of being a bad Jew, and of course not being the Messiah at all, certainly not being the Son of God. And of course our Lord outfoxed them all. He simply said, let the one, let the first, the one who is of you who is without sin take up the first stone. And they started walking away one by one until it was just Jesus and the woman left. And Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they that accuse thee? Hath no man condemned thee? Who said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither will I condemn thee. Go and now sin no more. So that's what is expected. It is expected that in confessing your sins, you will make an effort at least to sin no more. Obviously, you can't promise to sin no more. It's a promise you'll probably break. But at least you can strive to correct whatever vices you might have and to, and to limit the, the things that, that would cause you to sin. And I'm afraid we do not sufficiently appreciate this power of Christ and of Christ's priests to forgive sins. And often when we come to confess our sins, we're more preoccupied with what the priest might think of us, he having no idea who we are, because we're on the other side of the screen, unlike in the middle of disorder, we don't do it face to face, we do it properly, then we should be, and we're thinking about that more than we should, than, rather we should be concerned with the external mockery of the devil and his minions, which we will suffer should we fit, fall into hell because of unconfessed or badly confessed mortal sins. And so it's foolish to, you know, to be concerned about saying whatever it is that you need to say to the priest. He is merely the instrument of God who wields the power to forgive sins. And in the way in which we do confess, he doesn't know who you are. So, well, you know, but it's hard to tell anybody that. Trust me, it'll be a lot easier to do that than it will be to endure the, the mockery of the devil in hell when you, if you do not confess these sins. So, for example, um, I might hear in confession, Father, I behaved inappropriately with my girlfriend. Ignoring the fact that Catholics don't have girlfriends or boyfriends. Surprise. This is an insufficient accusation of one's sin. I can pretty well guess what is meant by I behaved inappropriately with my girlfriend. But that covers a wide spectrum. I won't go into the details. But for the confession to be valid, the one confessing needs to tell me exactly what he means or she means by inappropriate. He needs to tell me how many times he did whatever it was that was inappropriate, and whether or not his girlfriend and he are married to someone else or not, and so on. I need to know. Otherwise, I can't forgive the sin. It can't be fudged, as it were. And so it is with any mortal sins that we may commit. The priest needs to know what precisely was done. Now, you don't have to go into lurid details. You have to describe everything. No, no. I, Enough, a few words are better as long as they convey the, what, I, what I need to know. What exactly did you do? How many times was it done? Were there any extenuating circumstances which affect the gravity of the sin, making it less grave or more grave? Failure in any one of these points results in an invalid, an invalid confession. And speaking of that, of course, the real, what really makes a confession invalid is if you have a mortal sin that you should confess and you go to confession and you do not confess it because you're embarrassed or ashamed, that confession is invalid. It's invalid. And you come back to confession, say, oh, a month later, 
Then you go to confession again. That confession is invalid because the first confession is invalid. The first confession that was invalid invalidates every confession thereafter until you rectify it by confessing the sin that you didn't tell, plus all of the sins in whatever confessions that you have made since that time until the present moment. So a person may come to me and say, Father, I, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a month since my last confession. Here are my sins. And, oh, Father, I should tell you, five years ago, I didn't confess X, Y, Z because I was too embarrassed. And I might ask, did you forget? No, I was embarrassed, so I didn't confess it. Did you ever rectify that? No. No. Well, sir, I'm real sorry, but you better go home and make a good examination of conscience of what you need to confess for the past five years because you've not made any good confession since that time, and any, any communions that you've received are, in, are, sac are sacrilegious, and all the confessions that you attempted since that time are sacrilegious as well. Ah. So never fear to confess whatever it may be. Trust me, I've heard it all. There was a time I couldn't have said that. There was once upon a time I, I never heard any sins against uh, the fifth commandment, I mean the big ones, thou shalt not kill. And then I, I got my first one. I thought, well, heard it all. Just heard it all. So, you know, you're not going to shock uh, the priest or, uh, or startle him. Uh, you might wake him up. But. So, do say whatever is necessary to say. So, the first requirement of any confession is to adequately reveal to the priest what we have thought, said, or done that has offended God. Any thought, word, or deed that has offended God. And so this means that before entering the confessional, we have made a thorough examination of conscience. If we go to confession with, frequent, with, a, with a frequent regularity, this shouldn't be difficult. If you wait for a year, now you're, now you're going to have more, more, more difficulty in making an adequate examination of conscience. And keep in mind, the sins that you may have forgotten even mortal sins, they are to be absolved, unless your forgetting them is caused by a, 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 neg a willful negligence on your part. Also, it's important to distinguish feelings from thoughts, words, and deeds. Harsh as it may sound, how I feel is not what is important to God. Father, I felt such anger towards my he is such a rude, he's such a this, he's such a that. He's ah, God doesn't care how you feel, and you're committing sins just by going on about it now. And I know, but I'm just feel such anger, feel such frustration. Who cares about your feelings? God doesn't care. Oh, that's so harsh, Father. Well, look at what he did to his son. There he is in the Garden of Gethsemane for an hour, bleeding, sweating blood, because he feels horrified at what he's got to go through for, for millions and trillions and billions of of, of people who are going to never, you know, who are never going to take advantage of, the, of what he does on the cross. And what does he say? Father, if it's possible, let this pass me by. But it wasn't possible because God the Father didn't care how his son felt. Do it. Do what you're supposed to do. It doesn't matter what you feel. Father, I don't like that person. That's not a sin. You don't have to like people. You really don't. You don't have to like anybody. You don't have to like anybody. Just like anybody you want. But just don't act on it. I think I've told you before, Santa Fe is of a child. Jesus couldn't stand a fellow sister. And she was so appalled by this feeling that she had that she went out of her way to be as kind as she could to this sister, to the point where the sister said to her one day, Sir Therese, I don't understand what it is about me you like so much. <laughs> Truth is, she didn't like her at all. That's fine. That's okay. You can't control what you'd like and don't like. I don't like spiders. Who does? Well, some do. But, you know, I'm not going to, you know, uh, crush. Well, I will. Never mind. So, <laughs> so rather, it's, your, it's, it's our thoughts, it's our words, it's our deeds. These three things, which are the, uh, which do virtue or vice. And we may act or think or say or speak. In response to these feelings, that's why it's necessary for us to, to, to have a strict control over our feelings and, and, and how much they drive us. We unfortunately live in a very touchy-feely society today. 
you know, feelings are everything. Look at them in I mean, it's, it's all how people feel, you know, about anything. This is not important. And we've been deluded into thinking that it is important. It is not important. What is important is what we think, say, or do, which which either offends or pleases God. To sum up then, to be valid, every confession must contain three things. First, it has to have an adequate description, adequate, and enumeration of our sins, especially of our mortal sins. Some people get carried away and they enumerate all their venial sins. Oh, I had three times to my father and five times to my mother and uh, hit my little sister six times and my big brother 12 times. These are all venial sins. You don't have to you don't have to tell me the number of times. Mortal sins different. I need to know the number of times. Second thing, you have to give an expression of sorrow, of contrition for these sins. Normally we do that with the act of contrition. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. And I beg pardon for them. I don't feel sorry. Again, feelings don't matter. How many times have parents had to separate two little boys who get into a fight? Yeah. Now you two apologize to each other. I don't feel sorry. I'm not sorry. You say you're sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Did he make an apology? Yes, he apologized. That's all that she has to do. He has to say, I apologize. You know? And however he feels is not important. Get that, get that straight. Your feeling is not important. Look at the prodigal son. You know? <laughs> Read that story. It's an amazing story. You know? He takes half of his father's <laughs> inheritance and goes off and spends it on loose living and ends up feeding pigs while his brother and, and other family members are at home eating well and, and, uh, and doing well. And he goes, he said, what am I doing? You know, here I am starving and everybody in my home is eating well and is well clothed. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and I'll say to my father, Father, I sinned against heaven and thee. Make me as one of thy slaves. That was what he was going to say to his father. He, didn't, he, wasn't even, he hadn't, didn't even rehearse in his little speech, I'm sorry. He didn't rehearse that part and he didn't say it. His father didn't give him a chance. As soon as the prodigal son came on the horizon, his father was looking for him, apparently. The father runs down, grabs him, and, and the boy can only stammer out the few words, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. And, and the, suddenly the father's on his neck, kissing him and telling the servants, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a feast. You know, that's, 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 that was not, he didn't even say he was sorry. But we need to say that we're sorry, and that we do. The fact that we don't feel sorry, we don't we don't feel repentant, is not important. Again, feelings do not make the need, do not do it here. And then finally, the third thing is we must have a firm purpose of amendment. And it's this that I want to concentrate a little bit on here. A firm purpose of amendment. This is too frequently forgotten and ignored upon leaving the confessional, especially if the, what is being confessed are a, is a habit of sin. And too frequently, the penitent upon leaving the confessional behaves like the man described by St. James. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if a man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he shall be compared to a man beholding his own countenance in a glass, in a mirror, he beheld himself, he went his way, and presently forgot what manner of man he was. And too often that's what happens in our confessions. We confess to this and that and the other thing, and they're all pretty serious. And the priest should correct that and should at least elicit from you uh, a, a promise that you will do what is necessary to fix this in your daily life thereafter. So remember, ha having confessed your sins, having recited the act of contrition, as the priest absolves you of them, you say in your act of contrition, I firmly resolve. You're saying this to God. I firmly resolve. That's a promise you're making to God. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins, done, to do penance, will do, and to amend my life. To amend my life, to fix it, so that I don't do it again. Oh, Father, I'm probably going to do it again. All right. But at least do what's necessary to try to get out of, especially a habit of sin. Another phrase for to amend my life is frequently to avoid the near occasions of sin. 
that's part of, of, of acts of contrition as well. And Jesus Christ clearly describes what this phrase means in the, in the Gospel of St. Matthew. He says, if thy hand or thy foot cause thee to sin, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it's better for thee to go into life maimed or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye cause thee to sin, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee having one eye to enter into life than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now the fathers of the church have asserted that Jesus didn't mean this particular admonition uh, in St. Matthew's Gospel to be taken literally, but allegorically. Okay. There was one particular saint, Origen, some of you may have heard of him, and he took it literally. I won't tell you what he did to himself, if you're curious you can look it up. And certainly Jesus said this seriously as a stern warning to do whatever is necessary to avoid anything which might induce one to commit sin. In a word, to avoid the near occasions of sin, to get rid of the near occasions of sin. Well, what exactly is a near occasion of sin? The Catholic Encyclopedia explains occasions of sin as, quote, external, not a hand or a foot or whatever, external circumstances, whether of things or of persons or of places, which either because of their special nature, what they are or where they are, um, or because of the frailty of common, or which, frailty which is common to humanity, or peculiar to some individual, incite or entice one to commit sin. So it's a person, a place, or a thing, which whenever you are near it, uh, or it's near you, you invariably commit sin. There's two types of occasions of sin. There may be, there's a necessary occasion of sin, and there's a free occasion of sin. 